So I, I work in a fairly busy gastroenterology unit, clinics, endoscopy units. I've got six colleagues, got nurses, dietitians, all the rest of it. I have a small private clinic that I work as well, where I've got nurses and endoscopy unit and um, dietitians, etc. And I'm really here to bring you bring you back into the clinic room, you know. Um, with loads of GPs here, how many of you have patients with inflammatory bowel disease? That's great, great hands down. Getting to know your audience, how many people here are vegan? Very good. I was going to say, how many of you eat bacon several times a week? But I won't. No. That's right. So. Really, I'm talking about a pretty niche topic, which is Crohn's disease. And you might think, oh, why this is relevant? I think it's a really nice model of a disease that has increased in recent years, and for which a whole food plant-based diet can really provide a lot of solutions. So I'm going to go through it a little bit. I had this uh, quote here from Thomas Edison, the doctor of the future would give no medicine, but would instruct his patients to encourage him and frame the diet and the cause of infection. So he said that over a hundred years ago, and I think he'd be really disappointed if he had invented a time machine and come forward to us. This is a quote from an opinion piece from uh, Dr. David Katz, which is in the, the uh, JAMA Medical Ethics um, just this October. I, I recommend you have a look at that clarion call to doctors everywhere to get interested in diet and nutrition. Because now, food is no longer an essential sustenance, as we've heard today. It's actually the leading contributor to disease, disability, and premature death and need for medications in the Western world. So how is this relevant to Crohn's disease? Well, for those of you who don't know, Crohn's disease is a form of chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So when you have Crohn's disease, you have sections of your bowel, wall, and lining which are inflamed and sore and red and damaged. So the lining of a normal bowel looks a bit like the lining inside your cheek. It's soft and shiny and healthy. And in Crohn's disease, it's all inflamed and it's cobblestone mucosa and these ulcers. And beyond that, the inflammation can go through the wall of the gut and go into the adjacent structures. You have abscesses in your tummy. And Crohn's disease can affect any part of your gastrointestinal tract. Although largely we see people having these bits of inflammation in the terminal ileum of the small bowel and throughout the colon and also around the bottom end. Now, this isn't a very nice condition to have. It has a huge impact on your quality of life. And in fact, most people with Crohn's disease do not describe themselves as having a good quality of life. They, they describe their quality of life as being poor. Now, this is a diagram that gets shown at a lot of medical conferences because it's sort of summarizing the natural history of Crohn's disease. So on this axis, you have digestive damage, so your gut being permanently damaged. And on this axis, you have flares of inflammation. So we usually, so people have the disease for a few years before we meet them, and by the time we meet them, they already have some digestive damage, but they didn't know it. And then they get a flare of inflammation, and they go to see their doctor, and they end up seeing one of us who diagnose them with Crohn's disease. But what generally happens over the coming years is they get these episodic flares where they know they're unwell, but they're also getting chronic damage, stricturing, and abscesses and permanent damage in the background. And ultimately, 40% of them end up having surgery to remove part of their diseased bowel, and the disease comes back. So only 10% of patients with Crohn's disease get long-term sustained remission, and 50% require surgery within 10 years of diagnosis. And as I've already said, patients with Crohn's disease get a lot of symptoms. It has a really negative impact on the quality of life with school absenteeism and work absenteeism. It's also diagnosed at a median age of 30. So these are people who are in the prime of their lives, they're working, they're busy, they've got kids, they've got lives to get on with, and suddenly they're sitting in front of me with a chronic disease. So just a brief primer on what we know about what causes Crohn's disease or what we see under the microscope. It's a nice simple cartoon. This is a normal healthy gut lining over here. We've got an epithelial barrier, all the cells are stuck together with tight junctions, a little mucus layer protect, protecting things and interacting with the gut contents. And then underneath you've got your immune system which is sitting there ready to deal with any invaders or any problems. In Crohn's disease, on the right hand side, there's a few things going on. The mucus layer has been depleted, the uh, villi are damaged, the tight junctions which join the cells together are open and bacterial byproducts, and even bacteria, are entering the system. And they're getting exposed to the, uh, these immune cells, then these immune cells are reacting to them and causing damage and the lining of the wall gets damaged. 
And we have lots of different medical therapies. I'm sure many of you are familiar with your patients who come back from the IUPD clinic and run those various medications. And all of our medical therapies aim to try and modify the immune response in Crohn's disease. And we have pretty good medications. And they've been around for years. And every couple of years we get a new one. So corticosteroids, your prednisolone, one of the first treatments for inflammatory bowel disease, it's been around since the 1950s. Is thyroprin, the immune modulator drugs. Uh, then since the late 90s, we've had infliximab, so that's an anti-TNF agent. So that was um, just new around the time when I qualified for medical school. And the dramatic results you can get in someone having an acute flare of ulcerative colitis when you give them infliximab was one of the things that attracted me into gastroenterology, actually. And since infliximab came around, we've got adalimumab and ostekinumab, and this is what we spend all our time talking about at medical conferences and at, at your standard uh, inflammatory bowel disease MDT when we're trying to figure out how to treat our patients, trying to decide what medicine will we put them on. But when you look at the success rates of these medications, and I, I prescribe these all the time, they have absolutely got their place in the management of inflammatory bowel disease, but when you look at the trials, the actual really hard success rate, i.e. remission rate, so I want you to remember those numbers, they're not great, are they? So not many people get into complete remission, even with these medications. Ostekinumab is one of the, the newer ones. Um, that costs about £12,000 a year to be on ostekinumab. So these drugs are fancy, they're expensive, they have a lot of side effects, and they're not amazing. Now, when I was in medical school, um, we learned that inflammatory bowel disease is a classic autoimmune disorder. There's something wrong with your genetics, so there's something wrong with your immune system. So your immune system is attacking the lining of your gut, causing inflammation. There's not much we can do about your genetics, so we've got those medications. But over the years, we've learned that there's lots of environmental exposures implicated in the onset of Crohn's disease, including various infections, drug use, smoking, antibiotic use in childhood, other, environment, other environmental exposures have been described. What I'm here to, uh, today to talk about really is the diet aspect of it. And the more and more we learn about etiopathogenesis and inflammatory bowel disease, the more and more we realize that the genetic story is getting smaller and the uh, environmental exposures circle is getting bigger. And hopefully I'm going to convince you today that you might say that inflammatory bowel disease, rather than being a classic autoimmune disorder, is actually a classic disease of Western diet and lifestyle. Now, just to talk about the genetic story, and again, you can apply this to a lot of chronic diseases, so luckily, in inflammatory bowel disease, the genetics have been studied in great depth. In fact, a couple of years ago, the International uh, IBD Genetics Consortium did detailed genetic analyses on 30,000 patients from 16 different countries, mapped out their entire genome, they all had inflammatory bowel disease, and they did identify a few genes that increased your risk of getting inflammatory bowel disease. And if you had inflammatory bowel disease, they did find a couple of genetic markers that could slightly hint towards whether you have UC or Crohn's disease, and gave you maybe a little inkling as to what part of your gut was going to be affected. But the genetics told them nothing about how severe the disease would be, how severe the inflammation would be, if you need biologics, if you need steroids, if you need to have surgery, and even this team of international geneticists who spent years on this said in their study, uh, their discussion, environmental factors are more important, genetic variants here have a small effect. So if you have inflammatory bowel disease, your destiny is not set in stone by any means. And the fact that genetics have such a smaller role than we thought shouldn't surprise us, because in 100 years ago, Crohn's disease didn't really exist. If it did, it was extremely rare. Um, when it was first described in the early 30s, there were very few cases. Now, I know there'll be case-finding biases as well, but prior to that, it wasn't really described. But in Western countries, as our diets changed in the 20th century, rates exploded. In the 21st century, inflammatory bowel disease and Crohn's disease are really, really common, which is shocking when you think about the slides I showed you earlier about how awful Crohn's disease can be. In Germany, one in 300 people has Crohn's disease, Canada has a similar number. In the United States, one in 165 people 
have inflammatory bowel disease. This stuff is getting really, really common. We, we've got more patients than we can deal with. I couldn't find a reliable figure for the Irish stats, but I think it's probably about 1 in 300 or 1 in 200, looking at the various stats that I've seen. And then when we look at newly industrialized countries, as we export our standard Western diet to those countries, we see the rates of inflammatory bowel disease increasing. So um, in Africa, Asia, South America, Brazil, Taiwan, as diet has changed, we've seen more and more inflammatory bowel disease to the extent in 2017, the Lancet Medical Journal, looking at this data, described inflammatory bowel disease as a slow motion epidemic. So maybe every single patient who is diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease has a genetically loaded gun. Or maybe it's just that we're pulling the trigger really, really hard. The reason I recommend a plant-based diet to my patients is because I've been trying to find evidence-based answers to this question. So since I was a house officer working my first gastroenterology job, when we told people that just been diagnosed with Crohn's disease, they needed endoscopies and scans or surgery or immune suppressants, they need to come back to the clinic to see us every six weeks or every three months. Every single patient, and this is true now as it was then, says, what about diet, doc? What should I eat? What shouldn't I eat? And they're not asking, what should I eat today so I don't get pain in my belly? They're asking, is there anything I can do so I don't end up like that other slide I showed you with this progressive digestive damage and increasing need for medications? And as healthcare professionals, we need to have evidence-based answers. So I guess I, I, uh, I started as a consultant in 2012, and soon after that, I just had the time, I wasn't doing 36 hour shifts anymore, so I had the time to kind of get into the research and start reading the journals, because there's lots of research out there to show us that our patients with inflammatory bowel disease are constantly thinking, what should I eat, what shouldn't I eat, and practicing food avoidance and binging and developing these sort of eating disorder type patterns through no fault of their own, but it's just because they're trying to figure out what they should and shouldn't eat. That's some medical journals. You demonstrate the fact that I read them. <laughs> Um, so, a few things. So, how many of you have patients with inflammatory bowel disease at your practice? Loads, right? How many of you have patients with inflammatory bowel disease who are on a long-term low-fiber diet? Okay, you don't know, or nobody. I, I'm surprised by that, because the most patients that I see with inflammatory bowel disease, the only diet advice they've ever been given is a low-fiber diet. Now, I think the logic is, you've got diarrhea, let's make you constipated. So then you'll be better. But in fact, fiber protects from developing from disease. From the Harvard Nurses Study, we know that the people in the Harvard Nurses Study who had a pretty decent intake of fiber dramatically reduced their risk of getting Crohn's disease. Uh, in the University of Montreal a few years ago, they were wondering about dietary intakes in patients with Crohn's disease, and they found that amongst their children at the pediatric center, high intake of fiber dramatically reduced the risk of developing Crohn's disease. So why would that be? Why would fiber protect from Crohn's disease? So we know, well first of all, fiber in your diet is a marker for having more plants in your diet, because that's where we get fiber. But when you look at the studies, it's pretty convincing. Um, soluble fiber is metabolized by our bacteria in our microbiome, the short chain fatty acids, which actively help to reduce the inflammatory processes that we see in Crohn's disease, doing the same thing that the drugs that we prescribe do. We also know that fiber helps to maintain the integrity of the gut barrier, more on that later. And there's also lots of studies showing that phytonutrients may help to reduce gut inflammation, particularly in Crohn's disease. Here's a nice little study about fiber. The mantra is that you don't give your patients with Crohn's disease fiber. Here's a, a small little study, 11 patients with mild yak Crohn's disease, all on the standard low fiber diet. They just gave them some education about the benefits of fiber and gave them some fiber to eat. They gave them all bran, but I suppose you could have given them something else. And what they found was that all 11 actually found that their symptoms improved and the, the uh, qualitative feedback of the study was amazing because the patient, patients felt great because they had all been on kind of a junk food, low fiber diet to try and avoid diarrhea. They got a little bit of fiber in their diet and they all felt very much better. Yet, low fiber diet is the standard advice for patients with Crohn's disease. And we're all about evidence, right? So I wouldn't recommend anything unless it's evidence-based. And there haven't been any good studies on the low fiber diet in Crohn's disease since those two guys were running the world. And when those studies were done, they showed no benefit in terms of hospitalization, medical use, uh, medication use, or surgery. In fact, the patients on the low fiber diet did slightly more. 
hours. A little bit more on fibre and fruit and why it's so useful in inflammatory bowel disease, particularly Crohn's disease. One of the abnormal things we see in Crohn's disease is that the gut microbiome contains a particular bacteria called adherent invasive E. coli. You don't really see it in the microbiome of patients who don't have Crohn's disease. And what that bug does is it sticks onto these cells in the lining of your small bowel called microporous cells or M cells and it gets itself transported inside and it triggers an immune response. Nice study from a couple of years ago, 2010, under the electron microscope when they took the um, gut that had been recepted from people with Crohn's disease and put it in a medium so it thought it was still within the human body, if they exposed it to dietary concentrations of soluble plant fiber, they could reduce that process by 70%. If they exposed the same system to emulsifiers, sort of a, uh, artificial food additives that you'll find in a lot of processed foods, they could actually double it. So that's just one example, but it just shows how the food we eat can have a very real and measurable, Im measurable impact on just one of the aspects of inflammatory bowel disease. And at that time, those researchers thought they'd actually cracked the whole Crohn's disease question wide open, and they did another bit of research where they looked at countries' use of emulsifiers and their incidence of Crohn's disease. There's a straight line between them, and they said, we've cracked it. Uh, emulsifiers are causing Crohn's disease, and they wrote to the Journal of Crohn's and Colitis. And I suppose in one way they were right, but it was all part of the bigger picture. Here's another food additive called maltodextrin, which is almost in everything that's processed. It's an artificial carbohydrate. It's a stabilizer, it improves its mouthfeel and texture, helps keep foods tasting nice even if they're baked three months ago. Or if you don't want to buy a processed food, you actually buy maltodextrin online as a kind of dietary supplement. I don't know why. But <laughs> here, this, this, this green fuzzy stuff is human enterocytes in a glucose medium, and that red fuzz is the adherent invasive E. coli sticking up to it because those cells are patients with Crohn's disease. And if you put dietary um, levels of maltodextrin in there, look, look what happens. It just magnifies the adherence of that. So if you've got Crohn's disease, you don't really want to be consuming maltodextrin. So we've done processed foods, we've talked a little bit about fruit and veg, we've done animal fat and protein. The first clue comes from the epidemiological studies. So um, in Japan, one of the countries that westernized its diet in the latter half of the uh, 20, 20th century, what did they see? They saw Crohn's disease popping up all over the place. So they looked at dietary patterns and incidents of Crohn's disease and found a very strong correlation between increasing animal and dairy and the incidence of Crohn's disease. They, they concluded increased, increased dietary and animal protein may contribute to the development of Crohn's disease. We don't have to go to Japan, we can just go to France, the E3N study, looking at dietary intakes in healthy middle-aged women who were followed, I think, for 10 years, and high total protein intake, again, seemed to predict the onset of Crohn's disease. And they reckoned that the women with the highest protein intake, which is two grams per kilo per day, had an over triple risk of developing inflammatory bowel disease. Interestingly, the positive association was limited to protein of animal origin, high intake of plant protein did not predict the onset of Crohn's disease, which I alluded to earlier. So if we put all that together, so if you are eating a diet that's heavy in animal and dairy products, it seems to be linked with an increased incidence of Crohn's disease and inflammatory bowel disease. And this study, which wasn't done to look at IBD, which is a microbiome study at Harvard a few years ago, was really interesting. They took healthy volunteers and they put them on a completely plant-based diet, which looked a lot like what we just had for lunch uh, for four days. And then they put them on a completely animal-based diet, which was eggs, bacon, beef, cheese, and dairy. And over just four days, they saw dramatic changes in the gut microbiome. On the animal-based diet, they saw reduced diversity, reduced production of helpful butyrate, which is short-chain fatty acid, and interestingly, although, although they weren't IPD researchers, they found an outgrowth of bacteria within four days that had been linked to the etiopathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. So those researchers commented, we have found something that kind of shows why there's an epidemiological link between meat and dairy and inflammatory bowel disease. We just found this link during our microbiome uh, research study. And here's a real life example that I published, I think, last year. Uh, just a case study, 38 year old man, a doctor, wanted to lose some weight. He went on the Atkins diet. He developed inflammatory bowel disease. He was admitted to hospital. He was scoped. He had inflammatory bowel disease. 
He happened to be in a unit where the gastroenterologist was interested in a plant-based diet. He put him on a plant-based diet, and he got better, scoped him again. He didn't have inflammatory bowel disease, didn't need any medication. Then he stopped his plant-based diet, went back to his standard Western diet, and had a relapse. It's just a story, just one person, but it, it kind of illustrates the science that I've been talking about. So having been reading all of those research studies, it took me, I think, 10 minutes to present them, it took to be five years to read them. <laughs> so, so then when people came and said, what about food? And they said, what about diet, doc? What, anything I should be eating, anything I shouldn't be eating? I arrived one by one at this checklist, which I've now summarized. So I really asked my patients, or started to ask my patients, I said, well, cut out the processed food and try and cut out the animal protein. Cut out the animal fat, the dairy. Stay away from these emulsifiers, these processed junk food, and food additives. I don't want you to eat more of the stuff over here. So essentially, I was saying, eat whole foods, eat plant-based, whole food plant-based, before I eat, I'd even heard that phrase, before I'd even read it in a book. I hadn't read the China study. I'd just been reading all of these other research papers, so I was trying to give my patients um, dietary advice. So just a bit more disease. Has anyone published data on the impact of excluding those harmful foods from the diet? And the answer is yes, there's more coming. Uh, the no food approach, stopping people eating completely, has been proven to work in inflammatory bowel disease. It's usually in the lower part of the small bowel or the large bowel. We've known for decades that if you put people on a artif completely artificial food substance called Entral Nutrition, <coughs> which was originally developed by NASA so that astronauts could take food up into space but never need to use the bathroom. <laughs> so this is a kind of a food which is made of the basic broken down building blocks of nutrition. It gets completely absorbed in your small bowel. Almost nothing gets to the lower small bowel or the colon. If you put people on that short term, you stop exposing their gut to food completely. Yes, you can induce remission. And we use this in pediatrics, we use this in adult medicine. It doesn't work long term and it tastes terrible. As this little fellow in the test. So if, over the last few years, we have seen some really interesting studies. So here are two studies. Um, these were studies which put people with newly diagnosed Crohn's disease, and after that, patients with established Crohn's disease, on a diet which restricted animal protein and animal fat, restricted dairy, <coughs> limited dairy, eliminated emulsifiers and food additives, and provided dietary fiber and some bananas and fruits. And they showed really startling results. They did, they did allow patients to take half their calories from enteral nutrition if they needed to, but quite a lot of the patients still wouldn't take the enteral nutrition and they only had the dietary intervention. Because uh, believe me, uh, patients with Crohn's disease do not like that enteral nutrition stuff. And this is the first study. So over six weeks, this is serum CRP, a marker of systemic inflammation. This is the uh, Crohn's disease index, a measure of clinical disease activity. Down, down, down. After six weeks, we had 78% of people showing response and 70.6% in complete clinical remission. So that's just with the dietary intervention. That's with no additional medications. They then came back a few years later and a more adult population, and these were trickier patients. These are patients who have Crohn's disease for years and they're already on a lot of medications and they're still not getting better, they're not responding, and these patients can be really challenging to treat. What did they find? Same intervention. Here we've got um, Harvey Bradshaw index coming down, CRP coming down, albumin, which is just a measure of nutrition and how systemically unwell you are, going up, which is a good thing. And again, clinical markers of disease activity going down. At six weeks, 90.4% of people were in clinical response and 62% in complete clinical remission. Now, 62% in complete clinical remission doesn't sound great, but this is a sick patient group. This is kind of selecting out the more difficult cases. And if you remember the numbers I showed you at the start with the medications, actually these numbers are pretty good. Of the 18 patients in those studies who only did the whole food without the enteral nutrition, almost 80% of them got a remission. So once patients are in remission with Crohn's disease, what about keeping them in remission? So this study was done in 2010, basically took patients with Crohn's disease in remission, put them on a semi-veg diet, a little bit of that, put a little bit of dairy, a little bit of fish, or just standard omnivorous diet, and they reported right out to 700 days, but if you look in the first year or two, you can just see the patients on the semi-veg diet were far, far more likely to remain in remission. It's a small study, not a big study. 
the author of that study, Dr. Chiba, wrote to the Permanent Big Journal the following year to highlight his research. And he said, the evidence level is not enough to make national biologists appreciate the efficacy of a plant-based diet and in, in inflammatory biologies. And I agree with him. I agree with him. Because we need more research in this area. But the epidemiological stuff, the laboratory stuff, the case series, the individual stories are certainly demonstrating that this is a valid thing that we should be telling our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. This paper appeared in the British Medical Journal about 18 months ago. The evolving role of diet in the pathogenesis and treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. You can imagine how excited I was when this paper came out because this was another group of researchers who basically summarized all the papers that I've been digging out uh, for the last few years and sort of came to the same conclusions. Now, if you're looking for that paper, I've just set up a little quick link, or if you know a gastroenterologist and they said, oh, there's nothing to go over diet, whatever. So they can look at that and it outlines the evidence. And that paper, that's, the, that's sort of just a quick summary of what they came to the conclusions in that paper. <coughs> Essentially, they're, they're, they're really, they're, the whole food plant-based diet that we recommend as a group plus plant-based doctors ticks all of those boxes. It just ticks all of those boxes. It, it seems pretty effortless, actually. If you run a healthy whole food plant-based diet, you have ticked all of those boxes. So that slide looks complicated, but the lunch you just had outside, did that look very complicated? It was just really tasty food, and it ticks all those boxes. So I now recommend that my patients try to get their diet as plant-based as possible, because I know that there's a real role to play in preventing and even treating inflammatory bowel disease. And as a gastroenterologist, I spend my time See patients with diverticular disease, colon cancer, irritable bowel syndrome, digestive cancer, and Nash cirrhosis. How are we doing in plant? I'm all right. How many minutes have I got? Four. Okay. <laughs> so, diverticular disease. You've all seen patients with diverticular disease. It's ubiquitous in this part of the world. In nations where people eat a healthy, whole food, plant based diet, it doesn't exist. Colon cancer. One in 20 people in the UK and Ireland, maybe one in 15, get colon cancer. Among West Africans eating a traditional plant-based West African diet, it's one in 10,000, okay? And when you look at African Americans living in the US eating a standard Western diet, they have a rate of about one in 15. In fact, the uh, cancer screening guidelines for African Americans are much more rigorous than they are for Caucasian, Caucasian Americans for that reason. If we look at Nash cirrhosis, so we are all about Nash causing cirrhosis, what gives people non-alcoholic steatohepatitis leading to cirrhosis and reduced life expectancy? Study just out a couple of weeks ago in the Netherlands. 20% of people have fatty liver disease, and the dietary intakes that predicted are animal products and processed foods. All that being said, I'm feeling optimistic. I think in the future, hopefully, we'll have less inflammatory bowel disease. We're, 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 we've all been shown the Eat Lancet guidelines today. Look them up. A planetary health plate should consist by volume of approximately half a plate of veg and fruit. The other half should consist of whole grains, plant proteins, unsaturated plant oils, and optionally, modest amounts of animal sources of protein. How modest? Well, I'll just talk about red meat and meat. They said, uh, to quote from the study, red meat is not uh, required for a healthy diet. The more you eat, the more likely you are to have a chronic disease. But the evidence for harm is uh, equivocal at low levels of consumption. So if you're going to eat it, eat 7 grams a day. That's how much they were comfortable recommending to eat. 7 grams a day. Go and read the paper. There's loads of more information. I'm feeling optimistic because the Canadian uh, Eat Well guide says to eat veggies, fruit, whole grains, plant-based protein foods and more. Dairy is gone. Meat is gone. It's just about getting protein in your diet. Industry is changing. Companies are catering to the plant-based surge in plant-based uh, uh, interest in plant-based foods. Riverford Organic Farms. Has anyone here heard of them? They're a big company in the UK. Anyone from the UK has heard of them? So that I'm, I'm quite near them. They, they deliver food boxes all over the UK. It's organic food, meat, veg, and dairy. They are considering moving to completely plant-based. There's just one company that's doing that. That's the village I live in. I live near the beach of Shaldon in the southwest of England. Population 1,700. It's very Middle England-y. 
That's the folding green. <laughs> that's a seagull. We've loads of seagulls. And that's the village pub. The carpet is check. And you can, they serve pheasant, and there's always dogs and muddy boots in there. They have a vegan menu now at that pub in the middle of England. It wasn't anything to do with me. But they have a <laughs> vegan menu at that little pub. So that makes me feel optimistic for the future and enthusiastic about recommending a whole food plant-based diet. I'm so pleased to be here and to see all of these medical professionals and patients because you are the guys who are going to drive the change. And when people say to you, well, what do you know about diet? You're, you're a doctor. Doctors get no training in diet in medical school. You, you can say, well, I've been to plant-based doctor's event. I got CPD points for this. I'm going to present some of what they presented to me. I'm not going to present to you because I know about this stuff. And I'm constantly saying to health professionals, don't apologize for your undergraduate education. 90% of what I learned in medical school has nothing to do with what I practice today. The doctor you are today is mostly about where you've gone since you qualified for medical school. I know a lot about nutrition now because I've educated myself. I do, I do hundreds of colonoscopies per year. I do them very well. I didn't learn how to do colonoscopy in medical school. I got educated after medical school. If you're over in the UK and you want to hear more from enthusiastic plant-based doctors, Plant-Based Health Professionals UK, you'll be hearing from our founder, Shireen, later today. Warrington, near Manchester, we've got a meeting on April 13th. We've got a great event in London, June 30th, with Dr. Kim Williams, former president of the American College of Gastroenterology, or of Cardiology, who recommends a plant-based diet. Stephen Day from the Happy Pair are going to be there as well, and Bosch, uh, a couple of other, uh, they're like the English version of the Happy Pair. <laughs> uh, they're not twins, but they dress alike. <laughs> um, and if you can make it over to London, 12th to 13th of October, Veg Med UK, a plant-based health professionals, we're really excited to be part of the program and helping to organize that. Dr. Michael Greger is going to be there. There's lots of people that you've heard of in the plant-based movement going to be there. I think CME approved. I strongly recommend you try and get to that meeting. That's it. Thanks very much. Thank